Hello and welcome back to the Rugby Pod. I'm Andy Ryan. Big Jim and Goody are with me as usual. We'll be dissecting all the action from both the URC and Premiership Finals. Plus, we'll be chatting with Australia's Andrew Callaway. So settle back, enjoy, and make sure you're subscribed on Spotify. Pod, 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 pod. Rugby Pod. Father's Day, lads. How's it going for you? Tired. Out celebrating, weren't I? What, you... Saracens lost, mate. You, you said uh, you were desperate for Saracens to win. You wanted them to say fuck you to the world and the police. That, they were your words, Jim. I mean, what are you celebrating there? I don't know whether I said that, but I actually told you that I did. So I, I did. I heard it. I, I, I went back and listened to it because Dinks had been speaking to me all week and the FaceTimes that I was getting Saturday evening when I was out on the Pesh myself with, with Cookie uh, kind of underlined the fact that they were an apper. Deeks is basically FaceTiming me with Freddie, with Wiggy, and Deeks ain't saying anything. He's just shadow boxing down the phone. That's it. And calling me the C word. So I don't rightly think so. he was. Yeah, right rightly, rightly, so, so. rightly so. We'll get on to the Father's Day bit. I should say I went out and celebrated. I didn't realise, and you can say what you want, Goody. I know what you're going to say. Latch on to the champions, latch on to the winners. But hand on my heart, Hand on my heart, I promise you that as the game was gathering momentum, I was out of my seat jumping for Leicester. Lies. Hand on heart. I promise. Lies. Ask Cookie. Cookie will tell well, you. You've messed me back at half time when I've said you want Tigers to win yet. And you said a little. So you can't be saying <laughs> now. You can't be That's saying I was jumping out of yes. my seat. I was jumping out of my seat. I was desperate for Leicester to win. You're a turncoat, son. You if you laid. think about the way the game went, and we can get on to Father's Day nah, in a minute, nah, nah, I'm telling nah. you now, facts of life, mate. As my you put witness, yourself out there and when I Saracens, did. my team, me one bed flat in Luton, bigger than the studio, I'm desperate for Saracens to win, to say fuck you to the world. You can he now jump on the back of the champions because your mates with Brett, even though Brett hates you now because you back Saracens. One of, us had, to back. one of us had a pair of spuds here. And just lay it all out there and said, I wanted Leicester to win. And I said, Leicester by two. And now you are turning your back on your old Sarri's mates because you've got a bit of glory with Leicester. Or you're trying to get some redemption with Leicester. It ain't happening, Jim. You're a Saracen. You were clear Leicester. There's a lot happened. Dry your fucking eyes. 48 hours. And there's been a lot of emotion. And I'm hanging because I went out with Cookie to about half one, two o'clock in the morning. And my justification to Beck on Father's Day not feeling great is that I went out to celebrate Leicester winning. So let me finish why I'm justifying that. So obviously Freddie comes on and we can get into the crux of the game. But I was, I'd say I was crying at the end of the game. I was that happy and that emotional. I don't know why. It could be the thyroid removal. It could be. It's been a long old season for everyone to the point where I said to Ben, I've got to go out. I've got to go out and blow the cobwebs out. I ain't been out for a while. We're going away next week it's father's day the next day and my justification for that is that Leicester bloody did it so I'm happy to take any abuse that comes my way when Deke starts talking to me if he ever does well look he will do he's a champion now isn't he so he's happy and father's day wasn't ruined it was absolutely amazing as we know but I'm a little bit more hoarse than my usual self because that's what celebration does to you so father's day was good Andrew, you? Are you at the farm? Are you? What are you doing at the zoo? I'm on, as you know, I'm on holiday, Jim. So uh, I had a busy, busy few days. Friday, I was inducted to, into the Hall of Fame, Premiership Hall of Fame down at Twickenham. Yeah, yeah, a couple of big names there, no biggie. But yeah, it's very, I, just, actually very. You, mate, you've just said it like it's a nothing thing. Like, as in, it's a pretty big deal with the cameras there, you know, with the, with the big wigs there. Was, well, I weren't there. Was John O there? <laughs> there. Surely it was it was huge, wasn't it? Yeah, it was big. Um, and, and do you know what? It's you look back on your career, and it, it's kind of I look back on the Premiership finals that I played in. I lost a couple and won, beat Gloucester in one. Um, you know, won the Premiership five times. But you look back at the scenes, and I look at what Freddie Burns is doing now on social media, and how much the boys are enjoying it. And you forget we've spoken about it on here, Jim. When we won the final against Gloucester, we didn't celebrate because we had the Champions Cup final the next weekend. Um, and it just, you look back on things like that and but you, Freddie's never going to get that again unless he obviously slots the winner 
<laughs> next year's final. Maybe I'm writing him off too soon. I'm not. What, what I'm saying is he is top of the world right now. And when you win the title, the whole team, the whole club are top of the world. And, um, you know, for me, looking back on things on Friday when you're inducted into the Hall of Fame, it was, you know, it was incredibly moving, incredibly proud. You know, there were some clips going around of, of you know, my career and, I was a lot smaller back then. I can't work it out why, but um, I blame Not the ankle. Much. <laughs> blame how, does, the ankle. how does it work? Do you do you get like a, a call from someone that says you're going to be inducted into the Hall of Fame? Would you get an email or a letter or they just invite you to the... I got a letter from the CEO of Premiership Rugby and saying we'd like to induct you into the Hall of Fame. The event is on the uh, 17th of June at Twickenham. Um, it would be a massive honour to have you at Twickenham for the event and yeah, it was it it was amazing. And you look back on your career, you know, eighteen year professional career. I played, you know, of those eighteen years, I played fifteen in the Premiership. Um, you know, I had one year in the Championship with Worcester. I had a year and a half in Breve, and then I had six months, um, you know, playing for the Sharks and things like that. So three years out of the Premiership, fifteen years in it, um, and it, you know, you forget what you've kind of done really, and you don't really think. Of, Jim talks about his. Greatness. <laughs> I probably go the other way and talk a little bit about, you know, I'm a, a little bit self deprecating, but um, yeah, incredibly proud moment. Um, the missus came and, you know, I think someone thought that it wasn't missus, it was my daughter or something because of the age gap. And I'm like, no, she's the same age as me. Um, but yeah, it was it, incredibly moving. And then you see the final on Saturday, and, you know, as everyone knows on our podcast, I'm good mates with Freddie. Jim's good mates with Freddie. We've had him on here. I speak to him a lot. Um, you know, and you see that happening. And emotionally, I was invested in the game. I was at Twickenham, you're, you know, you, you, you're working for Leicester now. You've been part of the season uh, on match day, seeing the change in people and seeing what it means to those Tigers fans again. And then you see what it means to Freddie Burns. Um, and we, we can get onto the depths of everything that Freddie's been through a bit later on, maybe. But it was just incredibly moving. So Friday night for me was incredibly moving and humbling and proud and all that stuff. And, um, you know, you, you forget... You're talking about playing at Twickenham. And we probably always took it for granted, right? When you're playing for your club there in a final, you're playing you know, for England. Uh, you forget how great those days are. Um, and then when you see what happened on Saturday, um, it gives you time to, to think back. And yeah, it was a hell of a career. Um, incredibly proud and honoured to be part of the, the, the Hall of Famers now. And um, it's, yeah... <laughs> What could top it off better than my mate dropping the goal to win it on Saturday? So, um, yeah, hell of a weekend. And then I flew to Portugal with the missus and the kids on on Sunday morning. And here we are. And enjoying 32 degrees of heat. The, the forehead's red already and the kids are absolutely loving life. So uh, I can't be happier, to be honest. Andrew, are you hungover? Because you're getting very emotional. Like, are you... <laughs> what, what's happened? I mean, we're getting... Well, I'm emotional. It's, that, it's... I'm... I'm it's like you said, you said it yourself, Jim, you said there were tears. There, were, there weren't tears for me. There was just an incredible sense of pride in the fact that I spent 10 years at Leicester. Uh, I see one of my good mates in rugby, um, a guy I speak to regularly. You can't, you can't emphasise how big that is. How many people have hit a clutch drop goal or a clutch penalty, scored a clutch try with the last play of the game, effectively, to win it for their team in any it's a dream, isn't final? it? Like, that is I, a dream. Like, it must be a dream of guys who play in your position. Like, that is the dream right there and then. It's happened. If you look, it, yeah, if you look back on history of all big finals, so uh, obviously you've got the Champions Cup finals, you've got uh, top 14 final in France, you've got the Prem final, you've got the URC final, all these all these different finals. You give me yeah, the World Cup, Super Rugby, you could probably name on your hand five times where someone has hit a clutch kick like that to win the grand final. I'm, talk, I'm not talking games. I'm not, I did it in a semi-final. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking the grand final where everything, trophy or no trophy, is on the line. Um, and, you know, Freddie, with what he's been through and seeing the celebration and seeing everything that's gone on at that club, um, it's just, you know, you, you do get emotional because you feel a little bit of a part of it, not from the playing side, but from the history and, you know, for what I do at the club now. And, and, and the smiles on people's faces that work hard day in, day out in that club. I saw, you know, they were celebrating back at Welford Road um, and they're singing Champions of England. We know who we are. We know I who see, we are. I see Rob, the masseur, who has been there at the club. 20 odd years. And some. He was there in about, 
I think he was there in about 98, 99 when I joined. So he's, he's been there 23 years. And he's in the middle of it, like he was back in the day when we were winning them. And so it should be. From Leicester. Yeah, absolute hero of a bloke. And that's what it means to people. And that's why you do get emotional. Um, I'm in Portugal. I've been out for dinner with some friends. I've had a few GNT. I'm just over the moon, mate. It's Father's Day. The kids are happy. Leicester are champions. Um, and I'm in the Hall of Fame. What well, doesn't get much better, does it? On that emotional side of it, and genuinely, that's as, as emotional as I've been watching a game of rugby, I think, ever. And I think you touched on a few things there, like watching you being inducted to the Hall of Fame on Friday, how good the Premiership's been this season. I was meant to be at the game, but for travel reasons, I couldn't get there. So like, I'm sat at my mate's gaff, right, watching a game of rugby and the emotion, especially towards the end of the game when Freddie comes on, like it's real, right? And that emotion something that we've spoken about privately, Goody, we've touched upon probably in groups and maybe not said much about it on the podcast because we take the piss out of each other and the self-deprecating factors around that. Not many people get that opportunity. Now, we can talk about the opportunity Freddie got and we'll talk about it for days. It will talk about it forever. But the emotion to play in a final, not just to play in a final, whether or not it's 20 seconds, half an hour, 80 minutes, extra time, to play in a final, but to win it. That feeling, right? Now, Dean Ryan said something to me as a Scotland coach, and then he said it to the team. I said, Dean, you need to say this to the team. Dean Ryan, the most successful Scotland coach of any Six Nations generation. Not five nations, Six Nations. We finished third, as in a comfortable third, right? Champions and of the third. Champions of... Nations, we know who we are. That's what it felt like with a bonus anyway. But he said, right, and it sticks with me, and because I tasted what he said, what he said, not what he did, what he said, right? Oh, he spat it at you. He said... Huh? He spat it at you. He tasted no, it. Right. You tasted it. And it tasted sweet. Uh, like strawberries <laughs> on a summer evening. Um, so he said... How hard are you willing to work for that 30 seconds of euphoria? How hard are you willing to work? And this comes down to watching my mate Deeks go through what he's gone through as a professional coach, how our authors has worked on this year, and all them emotions coming back in. And when I played for Saracens in the final, the one against Exeter, which we spoke about, well, but we couldn't find the clips. And I, I personally had an involvement in that game. Sacked a ball, winning turnover of the game, and we won that game. That euphoria, that 30 seconds or a minute or whatever it, it is, when that was happening, I thought back to what Dean Ryan said. And I thought to myself, this feeling, I'm getting goosebumps talking about it now, is something that most people don't experience, right? And probably will never happen again. It did a couple of times after, but I didn't play personally a part as much as I did in that game. How hard are you willing to work for that 30 seconds of euphoria? And so for me personally, watching that final, Andy Rose crying, for me watching that final and watching Freddie Burns' emotion and Leicester and everything that they've been through, it brought things back for me because I don't really go back Personally, I think about going forward, we take the piss out of each other. Yes, like I said, we've had private conversations about how good it is and a bit of nostalgia. But as I say, you've been inducted to the Hall of Fame on Friday, thinking about, obviously, us being mates doing this podcast, what you've done in the game. Obviously, being a final, I played for both clubs. Played in the final for Leicester in 2006 against Sale, the one that Wiggy played in as well, and lost. But it brought, personally, back emotions of actually how big a deal it is, because... Winning the Premiership, right, it's a slog. And we've spoken about it before. The amount of games you've got to play, the Champions Cup involved, the Prem Cup, EDF, LB, whatever hell it was called then. And I know, because I'm best mates with Diggs, I never speak to him. I know how hard he works. But you saw that vibration, the shaking from Freddie, that kind of euphoria that Dean Ryan said. And sorry, Dean, I don't think you're going to get that at Dragons, but you got it for Scotland. I'll just say, <laughs> just bring it back down a few pegs. And that's trying to get it conveyed to the listeners and or people watching this. It's almost impossible to explain what that feeling's like. So you spoke about Freddie being higher than high. There ain't a word for it. And uh, that's why I tweeted after. I just said, with all the shit that rugby's going through at the minute, 
you know, from grassroots level all the way up to the top, you know, the concussion stuff and uh, the stuff in the media, how the tones change with some of the replies that you get on Twitter. I was watching them scenes at the end and that, that drop kick go over and I was like, I am so fucking proud to be involved in this game and to be associated to someone like Freddie Burns because he embodies, right, what rugby should be. And we talked at Faz last week, polar opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of characters, right? And I know there was stuff in the paper, the headline that Ugo mentioned, the, the article actually wasn't the same as the headline, but about the drinking culture and these things. Rugby is the ultimate sport, the ultimate team sport, a sport for anyone, all walks of lives. And we'll talk about Freddie a little bit more. Look what he's had to go through being sacked off from Bath, playing in Japan second league during COVID. But just, but just rewind that, Jim. Never forget what happened to him at Leicester. So he loved playing at Leicester. George Ford left Leicester down, initially yeah. to go to Bath to go and play for his old man. His old man gets up to a few shenanigans at Bath and then gets the boot from Bath. George Ford then wants to get back to Leicester. He's at a club he loves, being told by the CEO that they want to get George Ford back, which means he may have to move on. Whether it's sacked, whether it's we need to move people on or you're not going to play much, a decision was made for him. He goes to Bath, which is his hometown club. Stuart Hooper doesn't treat him particularly well. And that's the start of it. Then he goes to Japan and then he comes back to Leicester. Um, and let's not forget, he's a character. He had a year locked down in Japan in the middle of the COVID crisis. He's very close to his family, his brothers, his mum and dad. We see it all on social media. He loves to be a boy about town, having fun. You know, try being locked up in Japan when you are Freddie Burns hard, mentally. What do you guys make of the game overall as a spectacle? Started off poorly. I think we can all agree. And I say poorly from a spectacle point of view. Myself and Goody, without speaking for him, but because we understand the game, we knew that it was going to go like that. Kick is the balls, as I mentioned. But again, we can maybe fast forward to Leicester's game plan and the fact that they just got it so right. They just got it so right. that You were, you were not going to beat Saracens any other way. And it did open up a little bit in the second half, but... A lot of kicking, more than we've ever seen in a final. And that was the only way that, Le that Leicester could play. They, Faz mentioned it. I tweeted about it before Faz mentioned it. They had nothing to hit. They just couldn't find a way in to the game, could they? They just couldn't find a way into the game. And at times, and Mark McCall said it before the game, and you could see it in the latter stages of the game, uh, under the kicking game in which Saracens invented effectively. And... The irony of Richard Wigglesworth starting in that and just completely outplaying Alan Davis, and we can get onto that as well. But Saracens looked absolutely bollocks. Max Malings looked like he was treading water. He was given everything, but Leicester's game plan was just so right. A bit boring, but my goodness me, they just got it spot on. Yeah, it did. And you know, some people I've seen some people online compare it to last year's final. Uh, where obviously Quinns and Exeter went hammer and tongs at each other in a very different way. This was hammer and tongs tactically. It was a game of chess. It was who's going to blink first. The battle of the airways was the most important thing. And ironically, it was Leicester out Saracening Saracens, if that's the saying, in how they did everything. Obviously, Wiggy selection. And I, I did a piece of rugby pass, uh, and we said it on air last week. Nandolo should have been playing, in our opinion, for a point of difference. Um, uh, eat your slippers, Jim. Eat, eat your slippers, Goody. Like it was our words. Steve Borthwick's got it absolutely spot on. Knowing his team inside out, knowing... It didn't surprise me. When I saw Wiggy starting, it didn't surprise me because you, you think about it uh, and what he's done. But, the, you know, it, it, he understands how to beat a Saracens team that he spent a decade at, if not... How long was he there for? A decade? Eight years, maybe? Either way. Oh, mate, he, he, well, he, he was there through the whole transition. I'm going to cut you off here specifically about one point because charge downs, again, I'm talking myself up here because we're a bit emotional and hungover. Charge downs was my speciality, right? As in that was something that was my point of difference. Goody's really? frowning. It was. Ask anyone, they'll tell you. And, and um, how did you get in your career? Three? But I tell you now, I got a good <laughs> few. So I would go against the nines when they were training and basically try and charge them down. Wiggy, I could get nowhere near. Nowhere near. Mike Phillips, <laughs> I charge him down every single time. Wiggy, nowhere near. 
And if you look at the game and the box kicking, and I don't think Alan Davis is a great box kicker, uh, and I think that that was the difference. Marrow, on Wiggy, nowhere near. He was nowhere near him. He didn't say so, that Marrow at all, did you? I mean, Saracens must have emptied the tank completely against Quinns. Hmm. And they said there was a lot of emotional energy that went into it. And obviously, um, you know, the physicality was huge. We talked about it on air last week. It was a war. But they looked empty. Their tank was empty going into the game. And you, know, you talk about the tactics then. There's a few things. Saracens made 17 turnovers, which is unheard of. You know, So it was less of pressurising Saracens. There's a few bits in the game where I actually thought Saracens would pull through and win. Once they held them out, on their line a couple of times, those driving malls and Leicester had so much pressure on that second half near there. Then Leicester looked like they'd emotionally emptied the tank and physically emptied the tank as well. Um, and there's one thing I'll question on Saracens, and it was when Matt Scott got simbined. Five metre scrum, one back down. Your scrum was going pretty well. Farrell took an easy three points to level the game up with five minutes to go, whatever it was. A champion team... And I, I, this is where I thought Saracens were the champion team and would have gone for the scrum and scored the try to win the game, which ultimately they didn't because they took the three points. And, you know, we'll fast forward what happened after that in, in, and talk about that in a second. But that's one thing where I think Saracens have looked back on it and gone, should we have had a penalty and gone for the scrum with the whole pitch to attack on where Matt Scott's in the bin? Uh, and off the back of that, it would have been pretty easy, I reckon, to score a try. Take the three points. Then there was a lot of kick tennis that was going on from the kickoff. Do you know the best thing about what happened and how Leicester win the ball back, to, which leads to Freddie Burns' drop goal? And there was a massive groan that went around the stadium when it happened. Leicester were attacking. They couldn't really penetrate. They weren't getting any full momentum. Ben Young's on the 10-metre line, puts a box kick up on the 10-metre line. There was a bit of a groan going, oh, you know, why has he done that? You could feel it in the stadium. And then it's the one box kick that just absolutely landed in the middle of nowhere. Max Maylins didn't get any, anywhere near it. Van Zale didn't get anywhere near it either. The scrum half who came off the bench. And that was the turn point. That's where Leicester got possession back in around the 22. Then you play on a few phases. Jasper Visa steps out of a Jamie George tackle, makes four or five more metres. And then Freddie Burns up your step, show your spuds, win the game. But how clever is he? He knows he's been there at Bath that time when he was celebrating and Maxime Medard slaps the ball out of his hand. He's given it the cameras. He's given it the old head, isn't he? Every, no, one, no one can hear you, Freddie, but it was brilliant. Um, and he knew, and everyone knew the message of what to do. But yeah, just absolutely brilliant. You know, it wasn't a spectacle in terms of free flow and running rugby, but it was a, you know, I loved it because it was a tactical game of chess. Plenty of things to talk about. The red card, the yellow card, should it have been? Well, yeah, it should. Um, but, I'm just so glad that Leicester won in the end. It's, it's absolutely brilliant for the game. And at the stadium, everyone that was a neutral was supporting Leicester, which I thought was brilliant as well. Do you think Saracen should have been able to adapt a little bit better to what was happening during the game technically? That was their game. Goody mentioned it. Andy Rowe, like that was their game. That is what the championships, that is what the club was built on. And you think under Borthwick, who was a part of that, who for the first time after the game, we saw emotion like we've never seen. Again, something that we can talk about the coaches after. But with Wiggy, and let's not forget, lovable Rowe, Chris Ashton as well. Those three, probably in particular, because speaking completely frankly, maybe Ashley aside, very gifted. Borthwick, not one of the most gifted rugby players you've ever seen, but tactically, structurally understood the game. Richard Wigglesworth at the age of 39, exactly the same. And they were a big part of what Saracens were built on when they were building. So I think it comes down to it. They're big players. And you say big players, if you go back to that game against Quinns where the emotion was so high, and we mentioned that the emotion going into this game is going to be completely different. There's, there's no history, really, in terms of recent years between the two teams. You know, the hatred that Quinn spoke about in the lead-up, you know, the East Midlands derby that Leicester Northampton had, not that it was the same as the Saracens-Quinn's game. But I think me and Goody have mentioned it, a few people, Mark McCall said it before the game, they put so much into that game and Leicester found a way not to bring Maratoji in over the ball, not to bring Ben Erlin over the ball, not to give Billy and Mako 
things to go around and absolutely blitz. And just a tactical masterclass by Borthwick, Sinfield, Deeks, Alan Waters, the, the, the coaching staff at Leicester. Judy, you mentioned the cards before. What are your thoughts on those two? Oh, mate, Alan Davis is one as a red card all day long uh, for me. How's Barnes not given that, Judy? Yeah, well, well I, I messaged the referee, and I won't say who it was. Um, I messaged the referee a couple of weeks ago and said, at knockout time, is there any emphasis to try and give more yellows than reds if it is you know, these sort of tackles? And, they were, and the, the ref messaged me back and said, no, there's no directive for that at all. But I don't know whether it's then a subconscious thing. The reason they're going about it now, and the Alan Davis one, the reason they're saying, similar to Billy Vanapola last week when he's hit Esther Hayes and High, they're talking about who's winning the collision, right? Now, they're saying that because it was Montoya running at Alan Davis, Montoya, I actually looked at it and Montoya, his head jolted back. He was hit to the side and then obviously regathered his momentum and went forward again. So what they were saying is because he didn't, Alan Davis didn't monster the contact and win it, then, you know, it's not as high a degree of danger. But what I will say, twice now Alan Davis has done this, and I'm not going after him at all, um, but what I'm just spitting facts here. Saracens played Leicester early in the season at Stonex Stadium, and I put a clip out on social media when George Ford has got the ball as first receiver, Alan Davis has flown out the line and tackled him face first, head-on-head collision, and I'm like, how's that not a red card? Um, Fast forward to the final, exactly the same thing happens. We're talking about changing players' behaviours and there's two examples there where the same player as by hook or by crook banged someone in the head, whether it was one head on head or two, the Montoya on its shoulder to head. It's a clear red card, but because they're saying it's a back against the forward, he's not necessarily won the collision, so the force isn't great. It's not a red card, it's just a yellow. Um, And... You know, some people are like, Wayne Barnes has choked it. You see all the comments on social media. I don't think he choked it at all. I think that was his interpretation. And you know, you're always going to get different opinions. I think it's a red card every day of the week. Um, and if that is as well, then being fair, Matt Scott should be as well. There was probably a little bit less force in Matt Scott's one, but it's still the same principle. So it's a red card for me. Um, but at least there was consistency there. At least there was two yellows. But I, I, I cannot see how with Montoya getting his head jolted back in the fashion that he did and Ala Davis belting him in, in, the, in the face with his shoulder, how that's not a red card. I just, I just don't get it. And, um, you know, it's, it, it is what it is. We've got to find consistency. And to change behaviours, unfortunately, you're going to have to be harsher. And it, it seems like we've gone back a step where it's like, actually, we don't want to send people off now, but then... Is that going to change behaviours? Well, it's clearly not working, is it? So, um, yeah, for me, it was a red card all day long and, and therefore Matt Scott should have been as well. Montoya didn't go off for HIA. So we've got to look at both sides of it when you know, we've got things going on behind the scenes around the game uh, and, and we've got court cases or whatever. If you're getting belted in the head like that, you've got to go for a HIA, surely. Yeah, mate, it's a difficult one because we speak about it every week, don't we? Without doubt. Without any doubt, I sound like a bloody lawyer or a prosecutor. There's been a huge shift. We spoke about it last week with the semi finals with Luke Pierce in the Harlequins Saracens game, even in the URC. There's been a massive shift, mate. Like, as in, you think about where we came from. You think if we go way back, right, to the first player that got red carded, ironically, a Leicester player, Will Spencer, for the adjusting defender. And then we saw Cipriani get red carded as well for stepping in as the adjusting defender. No force at all, but collision with the head, right? And we're all like, man, that's a ridiculous decision. To the point where now, like we're seeing lads getting absolutely, let's say, monstered. Like Alan Davis, you know, like Billy's one last week on Esther Hazen, like Will Skelton's, which was ridiculous in the Barbarians England match, like the Matt Scott one. And we're sat there now and we don't want to see red cards. So us as commentators or pundits or fans, we don't want to see red cards. But when it's a red card, you're like, right, that's a red card. And they're red cards. And then there's been a massive shift. We're talking about Wayne Barnes, the best referee. Like, if everyone's calling it a red card, Luke Pierce, 
if everyone's calling it a red card and the referees in the middle, who are the best of the business, there's been a massive shift to not red card players, clearly. And I don't know where we go with it. Obviously, it's a bit of a negative subject when we're just talking about glory today. But yeah, yeah it, it's the, uh, the one big shift. Yeah, I agree with you. And the one thing I'll say on it, you never see much emotion or questioning of things you know, from Steve Borswick. Look at the way Steve Borswick was at the final whistle. There was no jumping around, screaming, shouting, hollering. I did smile. It was like a real he steamy kind of... Yeah, he but he crying. didn't want to cry. But he didn't want to cry, right? You see what Spot. happened when Ala Davis belts Montoya in the face with his shoulder, and then it's a yellow card. He's shaking his head. He sees himself on screen. He's still shaking his head because he's he's like, I'm, I just don't get it. And people, I think people, I, I was pretty vociferous on it on social media. Um, I think people would have thought, do you know what? If Saracens win, everyone will then be going, well, it should have been a red card, and that would could have been the difference maker. So that's why. Another reason why I'm glad that Leicester won, so we didn't have that debate as well. Um, and the mascot one didn't matter because he was off anyway. Yeah, it's effectively a sending off anyway. Yeah, so yeah, it's you know it's it's a mess at the minute. The way there's a lack of consistency across different referees, different leagues. I've seen a lot of people saying around Super Rugby, you know, they're even more lenient over there at the minute. So it's you know it's a minefield for world rugby. Goody, Eddie will be looking forward to getting a few of those players from the final back into his squad after today's shenanigans at Twickenham against the Barbars. Jeez. Um, where would you start? Who takes 50 against a 14-man Barbarians team that have been on the smash all week? You can't drink because it's bad for culture. What are you on about? Um, <laughs> listen, it's fair play to the Barbars. Tip the slipper. Sean Edwards. Do you reckon the RFU are regretting never offering Sean Edwards a contract? Um, yeah, he was obviously there's a massive French influence on it. Um, and it was just two very different teams in what seemed, you know, absolutely poles apart. You've got a, a bunch of lads that have been chucked together. Um, in fact, both teams would have been chucked together, but England more so would have done a hell of a lot more preparation on systems and everything like that. The other team, the Barbars, the French lads, whoever else was there, Cruzo. You know, the the really, it was unbelievable with his with his heel. Yeah, I mean, they have just been on a, having a ball all week in the Barbarians' way and have rocked up and you know, Bar Will Skelton's ridiculous red card, which we'll talk about. A phenomenal performance, um, fun, laughter, smiles, everything rugby should be about. You go back to Freddie Burns. How good would Freddie Burns be in a Barbar's jersey? You know, it's. <laughs> That's what puts smiles back on faces. You hear some stuff that's said in the press and virtue signaling and things like that around culture and drinking. And, you know, the bar bars have put a smile on everyone's face because of the way they play today in England. Um, you know, I know there's a lot of players that are going to come back in from Leicester and, and Saracens and, you know, top of the range players in that as well. But Eddie Jones, as, as much as he's, his comments after the game have said, you know, it was, it's not the real England team, um, he'll be hurting. I don't want to call any players out. I'm not going to call any players out, apart from Cruiser. I just watched <laughs> that back hill, and it's gone viral, Andrew, on your social media platform. And I don't know. I, I, I just think you're taking the piss there a bit. You, like, it's his old team. Like, it's his last ever thing to do. Should you have a bit of humility, or is it just like, fucking <laughs> back, <laughs> back hill gets it? Um, I, I don't know. I don't know. Like, obviously, I like stuff like that, but I just watched that and I was just like, I don't know whether because they had 50 points put on them, just a bit of a piss take. And obviously, Eddie, after the game, did an interview and he's like, oh, it's about, he literally just said what you said about having a smile on your face. But then someone mentioned about, you know, the performance of some of the players and he just like went, went off on one. I was like, mate, you just said it's about having a smile on your face and completely contradicted himself. But you can't take a Ravo's arm. Right against the barbarians <laughs> who've been on the pest all week, you, you just you just can't. Now, yes, it was a scratch England team or whatever. You know, they took Collier off after twenty minutes, like as a tactical substitution. Like, what what's going on here, really? When Poor you look fucker. at Poor fucker, I man. mean, it's hard. But I, I, I've been involved both as a player and playing for the barbarians and they're a difficult team to play against, right? Especially when they've got decent players in them, it, like either. Fijian, which they obviously had with Bottier, Vakatawa, even though he's French. But then you've got French players 
Jue, let's stereotype again. My goodness me, it was Jue. And you've got one of the best players in the world, Damien Penno, who has probably had three nights out on the best instead of five or six (laughs) in the lead up to it. It almost becomes an impossible task, right? And then we mentioned the red card to Will Skelton. You think in 14 men, everyone's saying, even the got even the people on commentary are talking about it as well. And mate, you've just had a, had a Ravo's arm put on you at home before you get on the plane. I know most of them, not but well, yeah, most of them ain't going to be playing in the test matches against Australia. But is it a good look that you've got George Cruz back ailing the ball over after you've had a Ravo's arm put on <laughs> I you? I loved it. Do you know what? Do you know what? I, but why not? It's our boss spirit of having a laugh. And you see a lot of players. You true, see this quite true. regularly, don't you? You get to the end of a career and yeah, it's the last kick of a game or whatever. And they say, yeah, I'll give it the prop or whoever's retiring. And he's just taking it to another level. So, you know, in the spirit of the barbarians, you, know, you think about Sarevi doing some of the stuff that he used to do. And you think, because right? it's Cruzo and he made you train hard over Christmas and play over Christmas when he was in Dubai. You ain't sure. I liked it. And I like okay. the fact that it's had about 10,000 likes on the social media. It's viral. The thing that's annoying me about Cruzo at the minute is that I'm seeing these videos. I watched him win the league in Japan and he's acting like in the middle like he's like the the judge and he's there. He's trying to get people to sing. He's putting them down. He's lifting them up. And then he was doing something for the bar bars. I was like, Cruzo, you're one of the most unsociable guys known to mankind. <laughs> and... Maybe he's changed. Maybe he's changed. But yeah, my back is still absolutely fucked. So that's why there's a bit of that negativity towards him. But hell of a career. You know, Eddie Jones mentioned it. And have we seen the last of George Cruz? Rhetorical question. I don't know. Well, that England side will need to come together quickly when they head down under to face a rejuvenated Wallabies group. Jim, you caught up with Australian wing Andrew Calloway, didn't you? Yes, I did. Top lad. Mate, Appreciate you chatting to me all the way in Australia. First things first, I saw a video clip go viral of you getting skinned. Was it you getting skinned by James O'Connor? And was it my good mate, Petrus Dupacy, stood next to you? What's he doing anywhere near that? <laughs> yeah, 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 it was me. Um, and it wasn't Petrus, no, it was, uh, it was our defence coach, Matty Taylor, uh, was standing behind us. Um, there's a bit of a backstory there. Uh, I, I had um, previously done James on the rep before and uh, we said, oh, we can't leave it there. So, so Rab's got right a reply and, um, geez, boy, didn't he reply? And they had the, uh, they had the camera on the old man getting the, getting the knees working again. So, uh, yeah, look, a bit embarrassing, but it's good to see the old, the old bull back at it. Uh, did they get the video of the one before? Or they not video that one? Oh, of course they didn't. Of course they didn't. It was lost somewhere. <laughs> I'll tell you what as well, Tatsy, who was my defence coach for Scotland, is going to hate me for saying that he looks like Petra Stupacy. Right, he has put yeah, on a bit though, isn't he? He's comfortable. He's I'll gone be home. passing that on. Don't you worry. I'll be passing that on. Oh, he's going to kill me. Uh, tell me about the lay of the land of rugby in Australia. Now, only watching it from a superficial standpoint over here, it seemed like it went in a bit of a dip, really. It seemed across the board, both from a national standpoint and the club footy, as you lads call it. It seems like now there's a real resurgence and energy around not just the Wallabies but the club game as well yeah very much so I think I um, personally got to watch watch that sort of all unfold from, from a pretty cool uh, space in that I was a part of it um, you know from 2014 to 2018 and then I went to England um, and sort of got to see it unfold from there and then I came home um, you know was a part of it again and then left to Japan again so I've uh, had a fairly unique um, view of it all, and, and I think you're pretty spot on. We sort of had a little bit of a low patch. I know we, the Waratahs winning Super Rugby in 2014, and then the World Cup final 2015. Um, you know, we're really on a on a great sort of path there. And for whatever reason, um, you know, there was sort of a bit of bit of wind taken out of the sails of rugby in Australia. And um, look, it's such a Oh, such a well well known, uh, highly talked about fact that uh, sport in Australia is a really competitive market, and and we're up against things like the AFL and the NRL and um, the A League who do a great job, and um, you know it's always going to be tough for us, and uh, it's great to see, as you said, we're, we're feeling a little bit of a, a resurgence, particularly on the um, just the mood around rugby. I think more people are talking about it. Yeah, and how is my mate Patrick Dupacy doing? He was at Saracens with me, and. 
I, I, I'm going to talk him up here. Weird bloke, weird bloke. That's not talking him up. I don't know if you've met his alter ego, but fantastic scrummager. And it's good to see him. Obviously, Dave Rennie, who was at Glasgow. Matt Taylor, Tatsy, who was my coach for Scotland. It seems like there's some good lads, which I think is important at the helm. Yeah, very much so. I think the consensus at the end of of the uh, campaign last year was that the coaching staff are world-class and, um, you know, that feedback was right across the group. So, uh, yeah, look, Petrus, we haven't met the uh, the alter ego, but um, we've definitely heard about him. So uh, maybe we'll be giving him a bit more of a prod to, to let that out and um, lighten, the, lighten the mood up. Well, he says if you beat England, he said he's, he's going to bring out the alter ego. I can't even say his name now. He's literally maybe started an NDA, so I won't. Um, what's Dave <laughs> Rennie's approach been? With the lads, there's an article that came out in the paper, not that you would have seen, I don't know if you're amateur on social media, but Hugo Monier has mentioned about the drinking culture. It was sensationalised around the lads having a beer and stuff like that. And then on the episode we did last week, we had John Dobson, the Stormers coach, who had a beer in hand. And you could see he loved the social aspect of it. Being mates with a few of the Australian lads, Drew Mitchell being one, I spent a bit of time with him in Hong Kong as well. Having a drink and the social aspect to it seems like a huge part of the DNA has Dave Rennie brought that in? Not that it was lost, but is that a big part of the the Wallabies kind of outlook is the, the cultural and social aspect? Yeah, I think the cultural and social aspect, um, definitely. Um, that's not necessarily with a beer in your hand. Um, although those things are important and, and um, not only Dave, but but the leaders are quick to remind us, you know, this stuff um, comes and goes pretty quickly for, for most people. So, um, you know, it's important to enjoy it while it lasts and, and, um, obviously, the challenge is to to not overdo that. Um, but yeah, very much so. I think there's a there's a really cool um, uh, atmosphere building around the group at the moment. I think um, Hoop said it tonight. Uh, it's the first time he's sort of been in a group where uh, at the beginning of of camp it doesn't feel like everybody's feeling each other out, and and there's sort of a, a bit of the, you know the awkwardness when you first come into a group. Um, it just doesn't feel that way at the moment, and, and whether that's because the group's largely um, been together before or, or for whatever reason it actually doesn't matter the fact that uh, that's not there is a really really cool sign for us what about you personally mate you spent some time at Northampton I was at Leicester down the road for the majority of my career as a young lad the only restaurant we say in Northampton's an all-you-can-eat Chinese how different is that to Melbourne did you enjoy your time there is what I'm asking yeah, well, I actually came from I came from Sydney, so I was living in uh, in Coogee with with four of the other boys, um, about two hundred meters from the beach. So r- rolled from there straight into uh, into a quiet little village called Daventry, which would be uh, just out near Rugby there. Um, yeah, mate, it was a baptism of fire; like it was intense. Um, rolled straight into to what was um, well, what the UK uh, media. Um, loosely termed a heat wave at about 28 degrees, um, which was interesting. And then, uh, yeah, look, I mean, the first two months probably of my time there were maybe a bit of a struggle. I think, yeah, I was, what, 22 and um, I'd just been, I just left the team I grew up supporting and spent sort of five years at and thought I'd be out forever. And, um, yeah, I mean, I had some pretty, pretty tough lessons to learn and they all seemed to be, hitting me at once. So, yeah, the first the first two months in England were tough, really tough, um, as you would expect when you move across the world to a, to a new team. Um, but after that, uh, geez, I love that place, mate. Um, the group at Northampton, and, and it's largely the same now, they haven't had too many um, changes, uh, was fantastic. And, um, I mean, they went down to Leicester on uh, last weekend, won it in the semi Um but it's so cool for me to be able to see those guys uh, who were mostly young academy guys at the time, you know, Furbank, Dingwall, um, Coles, um, Painter, all those guys who, you know, you know, are now uh, fully fledged members of the, of the first team and playing week in, week out. And um, yeah, I mean, I look back really, really fondly on my time at Northampton. And I think, as I said, yeah, I learned, um, yeah, I learned some pretty hard lessons some pretty interesting ones. And um, I was lucky I got to have a good time doing it. Yeah, I'm telling you now, that is a baptism of fire wherever you're from. Like, even if you come from down the road, like living in Dav- Daventry, you've come from Australia and Sydney. I mean, I don't want to say it's a shithole. I'm from that area, but it is kind of a bit of a shithole compared to Sydney. So good on you. You know, as a young lad, it's not easy. You mentioned the media hysteria around the weather. 
one of the other hysterias in rugby is around Eddie Jones. What did you think? What did you make of the media around, you know, Eddie Jones, obviously, um, coming to be head of England, being an Australian? Is it the same in Australia as it is here when it comes to rugby? Or is it very different? Oh, look, it's different. I think it's, it's um, yeah, rugby is very much... Um, uh, I, I would say just out and out, it's bigger in the, in the UK, in England particularly. Um, that being said, uh, when you see an Aussie take the reins of, of uh, you know, argu- arguably your biggest um, your biggest uh, competitor, so to speak, um, yeah, it's quite a weird one. I think initially quite a lot of people were pretty pretty stoked to see an Aussie um, in charge of, of England. Um, but then I suppose the... The realities of that come uh, come back to it, and um, all of a sudden they're going pretty well. And it's like, well, hang on, maybe maybe we should have had him back here, and all that sort of stuff, which is which is really funny. But look, yeah, I don't, I don't know Eddie um, personally. I haven't actually had anything to do with him. Um, but uh, yeah, look, he's a Randwick bloke. I'm a Randwick bloke, so he must be a good fella. Is there any stories of him back in the day? Him and Checks were at Randwick together, weren't they? When rugby was a bit loose back then. You know what I mean? When you talk about cultural and social differences to now, is there any rumours of him knocking about the clubhouse? (laughs) No, that place is, uh, the archives are all locked up, mate. No stories get leaked out of there. uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a vault. It's a vault. Yeah. And this podcast is going to come out after the final and there's a great matchup between Owen Farrell and George Ford. Uh, And reading an article this morning around how much kind of, not stick that they get, but how under-respected they are, I suppose, in the public domain and from other teams as well. What was your perspective on some of the talented players in England and as you look forward to the the summer test or you call it the autumn test, do you? We call it the summer. You call it... The ones coming up? Yeah. Yeah, we, we well, I've always had them called just the June test. It was just the June series. Oh, okay. Was. Yeah, um, but yeah. it technically would be our autumn. Yes, <laughs> yeah, there. Yeah, autumn of course. Course. Yeah, I, I know. So we've got a few fans in Australia, so they'll be like, "Hang on, you're talking about it the wrong way around." We'll just we'll call it the June <laughs> test. But when you look at the England team, and I know George Ford isn't in that mix, he, he might well be in it. But when you look at it, and you look at players like Owen Farrell, what what do you think about when you look at the, some of the quality that England have got on offer? Yeah, I mean, the the first one that comes to mind is is young Marcus. I think I played. Uh, we played Harlequins 2000 and oh, it would have been yeah 2018, 19, 2019, and he was sort of just coming through. And um, I don't know if you remember, but that year Cobus Reinach was just taking intercept after intercept and just going to work. And uh, that bloke can run. And I remember uh, Marcus just took him off a scrum and gassed him. And I'm looking at this kid going, "Geez, he's gonna." If he can do that, he can do bloody anything. So, um, mate, to see him come along is really cool. Uh, just on a personal note, from from sort of where I got to 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 sit and watch that happen, and then I mean, you mentioned Farrell and Ford. I think, yeah, it's pretty well publicised. Um, George Ford situation, and um, mate, hasn't he had a hasn't he had a season to remember? I mean, Leicester, a couple of Aussies playing over there, which is again always good to see, and. Um, you sort of keep a closer eye on it than maybe you would otherwise. But, mate, jeezy has been phenomenal. So, um, yeah, I'd be surprised if he wasn't wasn't in the squad. But, um, yeah, I mean, I don't make those decisions, thank God. And then uh, Farrell, I remember asking Goody about him uh, over in Japan. And the first thing he said is, mate, what a competitor. Uh, and you can see that. I think you can see that really clearly. The bloke is doing everything he can can to win. Um which I have a lot of respect for, a lot of time for, because I think that uh, sometimes that can be a really lonely thing when you're that competitive. And uh, look, I don't know. I've never met Owen, so I don't know anything about him. But um, yeah, he seems tough as nails. Yeah, I think it's the perception of reality. Isn't it? It's interesting that you asked that question. Everyone asked me that question. There's this kind mm-hmm. of enigma around him, you know, because you see him on TV, you see his face. He is that ultimate competitor. There ain't many of them like that in rugby. Mm-hmm. He doesn't do much on social media. I bet you don't have a TikTok account. Like, not that that's a thing. Do you know what I mean? But that can be like yeah, a perceptual yeah, yeah. thing around around the media. Um, let's just have a look at these June tests then. I mean, unbelievable. Yeah. Awesome. Firstly, out of COVID now, there's going to be fans yeah. in the stadium and stuff like that. You lads are flying, doing really well. There is that kind of historic rivalry 
between England as well. Like how excited is everyone? It's obviously an obvious question, but just to kind of get everyone down here tuned into the games as well. Yeah, mate, it's awesome. I mean, we had France here last year, England this year. Um, you're talking about big top tier nations coming down under. And uh, for us, that just helps rugby, you know, get to the the front of the newspaper or the back of the newspaper, I should say, which is important. Um, and then outside of that, you're playing the best in the world um, all year. So we get to play, you know, the All Blacks every year and the Springboks every year and um, Argentina every year. And uh, being able now to play, you know, you get, we're getting three tests. We get three cracks at England this time, not not one, which is what you'd usually get. So, uh, mate, the boys are pumped. Um, it's going to be awesome. Suncorp, Perth. Um, I don't know if you've seen anything coming out of Perth, but that's a hell of a stadium. Uh, Andrew, thanks for your time, mate. Really appreciate that. Yeah, awesome. No, thank you, mate. Thanks for having me. Top lad. Top lad. Should we have a look at the URC final then? What was the difference? What was the difference between the two sides? Oh, well, it was a completely different setup because of the weather in Cape Town. It was raining. And I'm watching that game unfold. I'm watching that first half. And it ain't a classic. And I'm thinking, have we ruined it here for John Dobson and his boys? Because they didn't rock up in that first half, really, the Stormers. And the balls, the physicality that they played with was ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. And if you read reports of historically the balls, and I've not seen a huge amount of them, I couldn't roll off a list of their players quickly. I could more so the Stormers because I've commentated on more this season. But there's this part to it where, you know, similar to other things we've spoken about when they get to the knockout stages, Clem on, um, that they <laughs> struggle in big games. So I'm watching it unfold early on. I'm thinking the balls have got this. It's called an unbelievable early try from Johan Grobler, the hooker. You talk about power. Have a look on YouTube and have a look at this finish as well where, where he puts Foster in, the offload that he, that he put in there. So not only have they got the physicality, They've got the, the hands to offload. And I'm thinking, this is not, not no biscuit for the Stormers. And oh, I don't want to be harsh, but I'm thinking with the way that Manny Labot is kicking. Misses a penalty early on. Misses one of the conversion kicks as well. That if it comes down to a tight aspect in the game, they might struggle. But ironically, he gets the drop goal to put them out of touch, really, the, the back end of it. So second half, Stormers came into their own. Game opened up, bit of counter-attack. Uh, Andrew Brace was a tough game for him around the breakdown and stuff like that, but I thought he was excellent. But the game opened up a little bit and Ivan Ruz, who was getting absolutely smashed in the first half, scored a wicked try as well, like a power play. And um, it was what you'd expect in a South African final, right? It was a, it was a stereotypical South African game. Like, that's what we saw. Like, weren't pretty, bit of blood and guts, physicality and the Stormers won that game by being the Stormers and I say that it sounds like a bit of a stupid thing to say when it opened up so when they could get their hands free when they could start offloading and 18-13 when it's all said and done I know Leinster finished top of the URC you know Stormers were second so in that sense deserved to win but fair play to the Bulls with the travel that they've had yeah it was a close game Change room wall. And John Dobson was great. I had loads of comments. I actually had a comment in the pool today from a bloke. Um, he came over, he lives in Botswana, Irish guy. I'm not going to name him, but I think he was called Paddy. Um, and he said, Oh, you know, I loved the podcast last week when Job, how good a bloke is John Dobson? I'm like, Yeah, mate, he really, how lucky were we to get him on? And I've messaged him over the weekend and he said he hasn't slept since the final. He's he said out. to me, he said to me that he's told his wife that there's a hotel debriefing. I'm shot through. <laughs> what a ledge. But yeah, I mean, delighted to have him on and obviously they're going to win it. But then you mentioned Andrew Brace. I thought he had a good game, Bracey. And I've become yeah, friends with Bracey now. I thought he had a really good game. There's a whole lot of kicking in this final as well, in the URC final, uh, 87 kicks in total. Premiership final is 105. Just the kind of rugby you expect when it gets down to the big game. Andrew, this is on you, mate. Oh tactics yeah I mean finals rugby three of the teams out of those four 
in the finals. So Saracens, Tigers and the Bulls, their game is based on it, chasing it, being great in defence and being physical. Three very similar teams, how they are sort of set up. Uh, Stormers, obviously, we, we chatted about last week. They, they love to play it a bit. But when you're playing against a team that does hoof the leather off it, you have to join in that a little bit so you're not just running it out from your own half all the time. And you, you temper it with a, you know, the conditions obviously played a huge part in that first half, especially out in Cape Town. Um, but like Jim said, the Storm was when they put a bit of width on the ball, when they got their offloading game going, um, you know, it adds another dimension. And it, does it surprise me in finals time that, that teams go risk averse or is it that three of the four of the teams are playing to their huge strengths? And, um, you know, you're certainly not going to see that many kicks from, you know, a, a Harlequins or, you know, a team that has a different ethos about how they play. But these are the four teams that got to the finals and, you know, they've done unbelievably, unbelievably well to get there. And then you get to a big dance and, you know, you do go a bit risk averse and, and weather conditions in that URC final played a huge part in it. I do need to say this around watching this final and watching the way that Bulls beat Leinster and the effect the South African teams have had on the URC. I worry now for the rest of the teams. And I suppose this was maybe the dream, but maybe the worry as well for the organisers in this. If you think about the URC, right, as a whole this season, the start of it when the teams come in, the way that the South African tests fell is that they couldn't play for the beginning part of it, right? For whatever reason, the travel, the COVID bubbles, for whatever reason. If these teams are fully loaded and you think about Natal Sharks, they've got Ebenet Sabeth coming back as well. Uh, they've got a wicked team on paper. Uh, they haven't really done much this year and you can understand why. Obviously, a lot's happened. The Stormers and the Bulls have, have taken it by storm. All I'm saying is Poor Dragons, Ospreys, Cardiff, <laughs> Scarlets, Glasgow. I know Edinburgh gave a decent show of themselves, but Zebra, <laughs> Benetton, so you're thinking, how are these teams going to compete with that? Like I'm watching that the weekend. I'm thinking, actually, if, if these are fully loaded and they're playing at their ultimate level, they've now got a bit between their teeth. You saw what it meant to the Stormers to win it. So it's now a thing, winning something in this competition. Europe trying to make it into the Champions Cup. What chance do the rest of the teams have? Do you know what I mean? So, you, said, you said it. Yeah, you said it then, Jim. The other caveat to it is... This year, those teams, they had some tough times, the South African teams at the start of the season. And it's them also getting used to this Northern Hemisphere season. So, you know, in terms of how much they rest players at the start of it, you know, I said it before in the podcast, they ain't used to playing any rugby before the end of January, are they, in terms of club rugby? Because that's when historically Super Rugby started. This season coming, now we're at the end of the season, this next season coming, chuck in Heineken Champions Cup rugby and they've got more travel um, you know, December when they're coming off a lot of these African players will be coming off the back of you know the rugby championship and everything like that, the, the winter tour when they they're used to you know ha having time off. Um, they'll have to temper that as well, and and maybe it works for them because they reach a crescendo at the end of the season. They don't play too much at the start, and it suited them this year because they didn't have the Champions Cup to deal with um, or the Challenge Cup. Um, but next year they will. So it might be that. Yeah, it's a it's a fantastic beast in these South African teams coming after the URC, uh, but they've got another layer to to look at next year in terms of how they manage the workloads and and the, the games around Europe and the travel with that as well, which may take out away some of their energy reserves later in the season as it affects other teams. Do you think it was good for the competition to have an all South African final? Not for the competition, I don't think so. Uh, for South African rugby, absolutely, yeah. But I wonder what the viewership was from a URC perspective in Ireland, let's say. And I say Ireland because obviously Leinster, Ulster, Munster, you've got three huge teams, well supported. Connacht as well, but I'm talking about teams that are generally there or have a desire to be there or thereabouts. Not that Connacht don't, but I wonder how many people watch that final across the board. I don't know what the numbers are. Uh, for the growth of the tournament, yes, having two South African teams in there for the reasons I've just said. But for the URC, I bet if you asked them properly, who would you want wanted there? They would have said a South African team and Leinster in the final. Where, where was but, where was Jay Z? All I'm thinking is, you know, Rock Nation. Jay Z is going to be 
No, no sign of it. Smoke and mirrors. Smoke and mirrors, mate. Literally. Let's take a look ahead to the summer tours now then. Scotland, Argentina, Jim. What are your thoughts heading down down south? Well, my worry is Chile first up. <laughs> Who knows? Can't work Scotland out at the minute. So in the shadows of the other tours that are happening, and normally the summer tours I'm not hugely bothered about. Uh, I'll be honest with you, personally. Not that anyone gives a hell what I think or want, but it's nice to have a bit of a break. But this season, especially in the lead up to a World Cup, the fact that I'm commentating on the Scotland-Argentina game, from a Scotland perspective, this is massive, right? Because of, again, we're going over old ground, but we've got to, to look forward. Think about what happened in the Six Nations, how poorly we performed, everything that happened around Finn with Hoggy. They're not touring now. And we need to try and gather some momentum from somewhere. No disrespect to Chile, as much as Gregor Townsend has taught them up. You know, it should be <laughs> a cricket score against them, in all honesty, whatever team we put out. So the Argentina games are the ones. And the Argentina have become a bit of a rivalry for Scotland. Uh, I remember in 2010, went down there, guilty. Fuck the self-deprecation. Scored a try out there, had marred the platter at picking goo, and we beat an unbelievable Argentinian team down there. But there's history in previous World Cups 2007, knocks us out in the quarterfinal. 2011, Contipomi was about 40 metres offside and Wayne Barnes weren't bothered <laughs> because he didn't like Scotland. Uh, but going forward to the World Cup, when you look at it, Uruguay in Scotland's pool, South Africa, Ireland, it looks like it's going to be tough. Why did I even put Uruguay in there to say it's going to be tough for Scotland? Because <laughs> they nearly beat Japan, that's you... why. I knew there was a reason why. But also you need to beat them to make sure you qualify for the next World Cup as well. That's, that's a question for Scotland at the next World Cup, pal. Imagine finishing lower than Uruguay. Come on, Uruguay. Who knows? Anyway, it's amazing how quickly it shifts. Eh? Look at Glasgow. Lose a coach looking for a new coach. Scotland's a big tour. Grant Gilchrist is captain. Been brilliant for Edinburgh. He was picked as captain of Vern Cotter. Has been trying to get back to a bit of form. He has done. It will be in the shadows to the other games that are being played. But I think the importance of these June tests for all the teams, but for Scotland as well, is for the reasons that I've just said, because there's a World Cup in a year's time after that. So, um, without stating the obvious, we'll know more about the depth of the Scotland squad because Hoggy's not touring, Finn's having a bit of time off as well. And uh, we need to look what Scotland looked like without our two star players. What do you think will be the result? I think we'll scrape past Chile. (laughs) <laughs> Chile, Chile by 10 I played in Chile actually that's where I shot on Harry Ellis in Chile uh, when I was English so I don't really like to go back there um, I reckon Scotland Argentina are a team in transition I reckon Scotland will win two out of the three against Argentina and scrape past Chile Wales, South Africa Wales are really up against it aren't they yes why would you say that <laughs> it's Jim it's Jim's horrible to him Jim this is your time to say what you've said over the last four or five years of this podcast that you're just not sure about Wales you know they're going to struggle <laughs> everything you've said for the last four or five years when they've proved you wrong I think it could come to fruition this summer but, in South Africa in South Africa but South Africa are a team that Wales normally do alright against look at the World Cup I, I say do all right, I guess. Look at the World Cup semi-final. I keep harping back to that game where Wales limped into that game and they nearly won it. They nearly beat South Africa because of the way that they play. Three but years no, ago. Not this time. Not, not no this Sean time. Edwards, no Warren Gatland. Half the players that were of that golden era are retired or injury prone or injured. It's going to be a tough summer for Wales, isn't it? Look at the Talk clubs. about limping into a tournament, Andrew. There you go. You just said it. We said it at the same time. Talk about limping into a tour. Strugglestreet.com, 3 0 to Zafka, I think. I reckon so as well. You think, how do you think Ireland's going to go down in New Zealand? Oh, that cool, sounds cool, isn't it, Goody? It is hard. I can't, yeah. I can't see anything but a whitewash, and that's just historic, no? What? Ireland if Ireland win New one Zealand. game. If Ireland win one game in New Zealand, that for me is huge in terms of the World Cup and 
where this Ireland team can go. I, easier said than done, mate. <laughs> you're right. You're right. It's just the hope of where Ireland have got to. Obviously, they absolutely dispatched the All Blacks in November. Um, they've got the wood over them. That's they've, why. Never won. they've never won That's in why. New Zealand, have they? They've taken a full squad. You look at the squads that are going out and you, you can you can make cases for, you know, you said it there about Scotland, they're resting Finn, they're resting Hoggy. And Wales are going there with probably their under-14s because they're, you know, they're in absolute struggle street. England are missing a few going to um, Australia. Ireland, full noise. Absolutely full noise going down to the All Blacks and facing, you know, everything that is so great about Troy New Zealand. Um, you know, and New Zealand will be hurting. They're, you know, they're, they'll, they'll want retribution for Ireland embarrassing them. The England-Australian series is going to be interesting, isn't it? Eddie Jones going home. Does that sound weird or not? As an English fan, Andrew. Can we leave him there? I reckon he might stay. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. No, it's, yeah. I mean, last time we went there was the first year that he took over and we got a 3-0 whitewash of the Aussies in their own backyard and Eddie was the Best thing since life spread. There's a lot of pressure on Eddie now. You look at the last two Six Nations. Um, you know, we know he's safe going through to the World Cup, but imagine if we lost 3-0. Um, I can't see it happening, but imagine if we lost 3-0 and Eddie Australia are good. Yeah, they are a good team, mate. They are very good. You look at what they've done in Super Rugby, you know, they've surprised a few of the Kiwi teams, some of the names. I like Paisami, Valentini at eight's a quality player. You know, there's a lot of threats there. Um, you know, and if they can pull it all together, they've got Quay Cooper back, Corey Betty, they've got Karevi's going back there. They've got the boys back and it's going to be tough for England. And like Andy Rowe said, look at the Saracens boys in the final, the tanks are empty. We're playing Australia in two weeks. You know, you look at all the rugby that's been played and you forget, I think the last time we went to Australia, when we won 3-0, Australia were probably lower than the snake's belly in terms of where they could be in rugby terms now they're sort of riding the crest of a wave there's a lot of hope there they've got the World Cup in uh, 2027 you know there's a, a lot of positive chat there around what the game is doing they've even got the, the cojones to come out and say we, we might walk away from super rugby as well so they're backing themselves dot com and you know for England it's going to be a tough three weeks um, I hope England win I think we I'm going to say we're going to win it 2-1 Let's finish things off with a couple of shout outs. We've got the Nags Charity Barbarians who are raising money for Cancer Research UK, a weekend of men's and women's games on the 24th and 25th of June. So you can check them out on Instagram to get involved. That's the Nags Charity Barbarians team. Uh, yeah, I mentioned it last week, but the Nomads they absolutely dusted the crocs over in Christchurch this weekend. So massive shout out to them. But also a, sh- a huge shout out to Derby Bucks Mixed Ability Team. Uh, they're just back home after a week in Cork playing in the Mixed Ability World Cup. Hell of a week out there, hell of a team. And also to Bolton Rugby Union Football Club, they're under 15s who have invited Briganti RFC from Sicily to be their guests in August. Uh, it's been a trip that's been years in the making, so enjoy that one, lads. Thanks, Gertie. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, producer Tristan. And thank you very much for listening. That's it. That is the last episode of the season. But don't worry, we've got some exclusive interviews and lots of other content planned over the summer. So keep an eye out on our social channels for that. And of course, make sure that you're subscribed on Spotify. Rugby spot. Spotify, pod, 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 pod.